Hello, church family. Thank you for considering Ezra chapter 9 as we are thinking through the word, one book at a time, taking one chapter from that book as representative of some of the ideas captured in that book of the Bible. We've made our way through the Old Testament now to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 9. Our text begins with the words in verse 1, after these things had been done, the officials approached Ezra. We have to bear in mind what's going on here. This is the era in Israel's history following the Babylonian captivity, which lasted for 70 years. In Ezra chapter 1 and 2, we see the first wave of captives in Babylon that are allowed to return to Israel, to Jerusalem. And they are led by Zerubbabel. Then chapters later, about chapter 8, Ezra also arrives with some priests and supplies and such. And so he's informed of what has been going on there in Jerusalem and in Israel for the decades since that first wave of people came. So Ezra follows Zerubbabel in that first wave of captives about 80 years later. And then in about 15 more years, Nehemiah will come as well. So that's where we are. That's after all these things. And Ezra hears about Uh, the intermarriage of Israelites to other peoples in the area, the Canaanites. And I want us to just see this briefly in verses 1 and 2 to make sure we're clear uh, about what actually was the problem. Uh, It says here that the people of Israel have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. And then in verse 2, Uh, the holy race has mixed itself with peoples of the lands. So these phrases are telling us that something is wrong with the intermarriage that took place. What I want us to make sure of is that in our minds, we understand the Bible is not prohibiting interracial marriage. This is not a racial question. No, this is a religious question. And I think we see that even here in verse 1, where the people of Israel have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations. Therein lies the problem. Because bear in mind, we're talking about this Middle Eastern region, so Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites are all generally very similar in their uh, characteristics as a people group. The problem was not that they were of other nations or what we would call other races, other people groups. The problem is that they were of other religious belief and practice. And their beliefs and practices were an abomination to the Lord. If you look down in verse 10, in verse 10, we'll see similar language here that reminds us of this. Israel's praying to God, we have forsaken your commandments. Verse 11, the land that you are entering, they're going to take possession of it. It's a land in, leave my pencil back is a land impure with the impurity of the people of the lands. Their abominations have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. So all these words that are reminding us that the problem is the purity of the people or the impurity of the people. And so not a racial problem, but a religious problem. And this intermarriage, I want you to see secondly, is characterized in the text as faithlessness. Ezra says of this mixed marriage, and in this 
faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. In other words, the leaders were guilty of it first and foremost, and then the rest of the people. But this raises a question that I want us to consider. Why is it called faithlessness instead of disobedience? Why isn't it said that, and this disobedience by the hand of the officials and chief men was foremost, especially when the language that follows, especially in verse 10 and 11, is the language of commandments. What shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments. Verse 11, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples. 12, therefore do not give your daughters and sons in those marriages. So clearly it could be called disobedience, and yet the word in our text is the word faithlessness. We should be wrestling with the connection between faithlessness and disobedience. How do they go together? How is faithlessness at the heart of disobedience? It's a good reminder to us, even today, that I will be tempted today to believe the devil's lie and not believe God's promise, not believe God's declaration of who he is. Be careful. Be watchful, be on guard against faithlessness. Well, Ezra begins to hear of the intermarriage, the failure of God's people, and begins to demonstrably grieve this sinfulness. Verse 3, Tor's garment pulled hair from his head and beard and sat appalled. It's just shocking. Then he's joined by others who feel the same way. And I want you to look at the description of these people who join him. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel. They're the ones who gathered all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Again, our purpose isn't to take everything out of the text that we can find, but to to just flag a few things for you to be thinking on, and this is one of them. Consider this group of people, all who trembled at the words of God. First, wrestle with what it means to tremble at the words of God. And then, Ask yourself, what words of God are you hearing? Where has God been speaking to you in his word lately? Why would you neglect time in the word if this is the very word of God to us? These are his words for us. Are we moved by them? Do we tremble at them? Ezra then in the evening, begins to pray. Verse six. Let's consider the approach that Ezra takes here, the language that he uses. I am ashamed. I blush to lift my face. Our iniquities higher than our heads. Guilt to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt for our iniquities. We've been given to captivity, plundering, shame. This is the language of humility, the language of repentance, the language of responsibility, the anguish over sin, seeing it as God sees it. When you read this opening line, ashamed and blushing to lift my face, 
it, it calls to mind the language of the publican in Luke 18, verse 9 through 14, when the Bible tells a story of two men who went up into the temple to pray. And one simply rehearsed his goodness. Look at what I've done. And the other, ashamed to even lift his head, agonizes over his sin. Read that account in Luke 18. Match it with Ezra 9 and ask God to give you a brokenness over sin, your own, and as we see here in Ezra 9, a collective sense of sin, of God's people, of God's church. Shame and guilt have fallen on hard times, and yet we see it over and over again in these couple of verses. And I think when we read Romans 2, which speaks of the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, I think shame and guilt, as resistant as we are to them, can become expressions of God's kindness and mercy to keep us from the ruin of sin. And we come to verse 8. Verse 8. Now listen to this language. I think it's the language of hope. Now, after rehearsing captivity, plundering, shame, now something can be different. For a brief moment, favor has been shown by God to leave us a remnant, to give us a secure hold within the holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving. It's not entitlement or demand. It's a recognition that even, even just a glimpse of mercy could be helpful. It might brighten their eyes and give them just a little bit of hope, a little bit of reviving in our slavery. You see, they're not out of the woods yet. They've been allowed to return, but there's an enormous amount of work to do. And they're still subject to the king, to King Cyrus. But there's hope. There's hope. And that's what this story of Ezra and the post-exile period of Israel's history is all about that there is hope that God is doing something still and that this remnant is a picture of God's deliverance and restoration that will be fulfilled in a greater story yet to come. And here's another glimpse into that greater story. Verse 9, Ezra says, For we are slaves, yet... Our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us in his steadfast love before the king of Persia. God's hand was in Cyrus's allowance, his granting of the return of the Israelite captives. God was in that. You see, as remembers, we were slaves, yet God did not forsake us in our slavery. We've heard that before. You can go back and read Exodus chapter 2, and there you'll read of God hearing the cries of his people and implementing his plan for the Exodus, for the redemption of the Israelites. And we'll hear it again in Colossians 1 when God will speak of taking, delivering his people out of darkness and into the domain of the kingdom of his son. We'll see it in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, where Christ came to destroy death and the devil and to deliver those who were subject to lifelong slavery. This is your story. We were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our slavery, but he extended his steadfast love to us, as Romans 5 says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, in these verses that follow, Ezra recounts in his prayer the commands that God had given, 
how they were warned not to intermarry. And yet they did. They did. And so they were taken captive by the Babylonians. They suffered 70 years of captivity. Now, now Ezra says, we've returned to the land. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, see that God, he says, you, God, have punished us less than we deserved. You've given us this remnant. Question. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry? Ezra's point is, we just lived through 70 years of captivity because we failed to obey God's commands regarding intermarriage and a host of others. So how is it now that we're going to go back and do the very same thing and not expect God to judge us? 15. O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. Behold, we are before you in our guilt. Those go together. God is just. And if we have guilt, it is because God righteously has condemned us. Ezra's point is none can stand before you because of this. A couple songs come to mind when Ezra is, is appalled that they are committing the same sin that had led to their captivity. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, beware today of wandering, beware of going back again to the same worn path of sin. Break away from that habit. Choose to walk on the path of righteousness. Follow God's way, not your own. You're prone to wander. Be aware of that. But as we come to the end of Ezra chapter 9, I want you to see this great hope for the gospel story yet to come. Yes, none can stand before you. None can stand before you because of this, because of this guilt tied to breaking the commandments. We can't stand before you. So, so what is the longing? What is the desire? What is the, what is the hope of Ezra chapter 9? The hope is that God would make a way for us, though guilty, to stand before the just judge. How can we stand before him in our sin? And yet the scriptures tell us it's through our faith in Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand we sing, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. There is our gospel hope. It's true, we can't stand before God in our guilt. But dressed in the righteousness that Christ has won for us, this story changes. And the story of our guilt before God becomes the story of our acceptance by God. And Romans tells us there is, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So hallelujah for a story in Ezra 9 that creates in us a longing for the ability to stand before God, not to be condemned, but to be justified through faith in the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you as you dwell on these things.